Hey, everybody. If you want the full uncensored episode, be sure to click the link below to join the Fight Club on Patreon. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. You, you know my saying about Twister is, right? Knuckles, like, he's smart enough to run a bank. He'd just rather rob it. <laughs> Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, the yeah. fucking guy was Scholastic Player of the Year two years in a row in the Western Hockey League. Now, a lot of people will say that's no big feat because it's the fucking Western Hockey League. You dumb fuckers never yeah. won a right? But yeah. this is the same guy that I think could be responsible for a fire alarm going off during exam time because he wasn't prepared. <laughs> no fucking exam canceled. Like, just anything like, you know. Now, he was going to be a straight-A student one way or the other. He just yeah. didn't, he had to fucking find a way to do it. That'll be a suspension. That'll be a fine. Nyland going ballistic. He's a freaking madman. I'm Chris Nyland, and this is the Raw Knuckles Podcast. So here's what I got from him. Knuckles, let me preface this by following the following observation by saying, I love you. And I would, ex- I would expect for you to do the same if you saw what I'm commenting on now, if it was me. All right, so that that picture come up. Yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. Here's the picture. Yeah, so he here's screenshots picture. your picture. Yeah, yeah. There, there it is. Yeah. So he sends me, and then he says, "In that picture, you look like a surprised catfish minus the plastic surgery, a man who just woke up after receiving involuntarily and unconsciously another man's DNA drop in his mailbox while having a sleepover at a creepy uncle's house at Christmas." <laughs> I'm like, Fuck. I get this, and I'm going, what, what? And then he sent it. Then he sent it to Jimmy Vizi. So Jimmy gets it, and he's like, he, he said Nux because he didn't put his number on it. Oh yeah. So no. Jimmy said Nux. I, I just got this thing. Um, I don't know what the hell. Uh, he says I don't know what the hell it is. Um, uh-huh. some nut sent me this thing, and uh. He said, I thought it was someone who was breaking balls. Leave it to him. Uh, he has a soft spot for you. And, and he, he said, Twister must have changed his number, blah, blah, blah. But hey, but he how, said he's out listen, of it. <laughs> now, he's a fucking disaster. But how do you make up Jimmy? How do you make Jimmy Vizi's fucking text messages out? Like, I mean, but it's a code all in its own. It's really hard. It's fucking unbelievable. You... First, you have to be from the East Coast. That's it. so you got to leg up on us, okay? And then you have to understand who he is and where he came from. And then he's, it's probably a fucking burner, so you don't even know who the fuck it is anyway. And it's, it's fucking unbelievable. I look at the text, I'm like, what is this fucking nonsense? Well, you know what he does? Um, he uses Siri, and Siri can't fucking understand him. Yeah, well, nobody can. It's like yeah. you know, he so it comes out. Talk text? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, God. yeah. He uses the talk text. So once he he goes blah, 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 real fast, and, the, you're and like, he just you fucking can't, doesn't can't read it. Sends it. it. Sends you look it. at him, you're yeah. like, what the fuck is this mess? <laughs> so, Chase, good to see you, pal. Um, and it, first of all, how you feeling? I feel good, thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm on the um the worst I'm gonna feel is hopefully behind me. Like as of yesterday, I feel better today. It was a horrible week but they i knew that was coming but the good news is is that you know we're, we they tell me it's in remission they'll know for sure the tissue tests and the bone biopsy come back uh towards the end of may so may 10th i think is my bone biopsy and then after that i'll uh i'll know for sure uh just uh you know that it's in remission and then we just start keeping up with our checkups and just stay on top of it so you know Back in 2023, uh, we had you on about, it's probably about eight months before you got this diagnosis. And, you know, certainly the hockey community is a close community and yeah. everybody knows Chaser, everybody loves Chaser and um, certainly touched a lot of people and uh, some of the things we've heard over the course of this time going through your treatments and stuff. I guess for the for the faithful listeners here, what what did you take from your time in hockey? You know, all you learned in hockey from it, being a kid and everything um, to the NHL, making it 
and, and living your dream. What did you take from that that helped you in this battle against uh, the type of cancer you have, uh, leukemia? Well, first of all, let's back up. You said everybody knows Chaser and loves Chaser. Yeah, everybody <laughs> loves Chaser. Come on. <laughs> Knox, listen to me. It's hard. I, no, but I want to make a comment about that. All right. You know, like we had a lot of the same characteristics on the ice, which we were complete yeah. assholes. Okay. And, and you, <laughs> and I mean, self-admitted, but you, you were probably worse than me, but, I, but assholes, right? So you, <laughs> there's times where I would get a text message from a guy and I go, no, there's no fucking way that guy's text me that. There's no way that's him. Right. Somebody, yeah. one of my buddies right. messing with me. Right. So I wait a few days and then I'd say, Fuck, I'm feeling bad. And I've screenshot the number. So I send it to another guy, you know, and to use it as an example, one of them was Chris Draper. And I yeah. sent it to him and I said, uh, Drapes, uh, I, pr- I sent it to Shani and I said, Shani, you know, is this Chris Draper's phone number? And he goes, yeah. And I just, I didn't send him the text. I just sent him the phone, the thing and I go because now and then I start thinking fucking Shanahan might be the guy playing the punk in me right now right so <laughs> yeah. now I'm really yeah. thinking this through so then I send Drapes a note or I called I can't remember what it was but at the end of it thanked him and said you know man I really appreciate your support because I wasn't exactly loved by that line of him all being you know he stood behind Joey and yeah and yeah and I and so I said I said to him I said uh Somehow it came out. I wouldn't expect one from your winger, which was Malpy. Yeah. Because, you know, but it's amazing how the community rallies together. And, you know, so as as bad as you were to whoever you think you were the worst to on the ice, and there's some guys sometimes when we knew we could get to and we were, like I said, assholes, they really knew that they'd love to have you on your team. So the, you asked me what I learned. I learned that the that the brotherhood of the hockey community is like no other. Now I wouldn't compare it to the military because I'm not so naive to believe that that what the the bond they have and what they have to go through is is much different. But there I are believe, similarities. There, there are, are similarities, similarities, but I will tell you in sports, there's no one like it. I don't give a shit, and I've told you this on your show before. I think I don't give a shit if you're going to a to a football game to have fun you're going to a party to have fun you're going to a brawl downtown you're going to a brawl on the ice it doesn't matter whether you're going to a dinner or whatever you go with hockey players you want to have more fun go with hockey players you you want to go Mm -hmm. go with a bunch of guys are going to be warriors and go to bat for you go with fucking hockey players you want to go fight with a bunch of guys you fucking take the (laughs) hockey players for sure okay that's a hundred percent for sure because you got the basketball players big and strong and they get a hold of you. You just knock the hell out of them. The baseball players, I don't need to talk about. The, the football players, it's all hickeys and hand jobs. They're going to wrestle you, <laughs> throw you around, <laughs> strangle you a little bit, but they're not going to really <laughs> fight with you. Whereas if you want straight out tough guys and fighters, you fucking take the hockey players. So there's no brotherhood like it. That's what I would say. Okay. Um, and then. The other thing is, is that I learned like, and in, in, in I, I may not have noticed this until I, until I had my, um, my, may, maybe my first time viewing that video that we just did, the new video uh, for the Alumni Association. Uh, and cancer's beat up some pretty tough bastards out there, right? So yeah. when you start looking at some of your teammates you've lost and guys that were, it didn't mean fighting tough, but just tough warrior type of guys like LaFleur and, and Clark Gillies and get, like, there's some, there's some Doug Wickenheiser, Doug Wickenheiser. you can go on and on. I mean, it's kicked yeah. the hell out of a lot of tough guys. Right. So it doesn't pick and choose, you know, the weak and the meek. That's not how it works. So you can be as tough as, you know, barbed wire, it don't matter. It, it, it doesn't pick and choose. And so for me, I've, I've, look, I appreciate things, I think, a little bit more. I have to 
slow down a little bit more and then start doing some things that I enjoy a little bit more because, you know, who knows, it could have gone the other way. It kicked the piss out of me and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm on the south side of it and, 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 you know, what's all the work and running around worth? Nothing. Get closer to the action in the Fight Club with the Raw Knuckles podcast over on Patreon. Whether you're an instigator, enforcer, or aiming for the Hall of Fame, there's something for everyone waiting for you. Don't miss your chance to be part of the ultimate hockey community. You, uh, Chaser, do you, did you end up connecting with anybody or currently talking with, currently talking with somebody that's been through this? I connected with Brian Boyle, reached out to yeah. him. I reached out to um, a couple of guys. You know, Mario Lemieux and Mark Bergerman have a buddy, Luke Robitaille. They have a buddy uh, in uh, L.A. Uh, that went through this exact thing so they f- phoned and said hey here's his number you should connect with him he'll have a conversation with you um and tony granado and then and then i i, yeah. I, I think i told you like tony's going through it right now but darren kimball's going through it for three years right now and never told anyone i didn't know darren kimball god yeah so he, phoned me and he got him. a little bit emotional and and the phone and i just said, what, what are you doing, buddy? Like, Jesus, I said, this is miserable going through this. And I got 6,000 people behind me that are calling me every day and stuff. And I said, you're doing this by yourself. What's the matter with you? Like, why didn't you? And he just, you know, he wanted to keep to himself. So I eventually got him to come out and talk about it a little bit. And now he's, uh, he's not only getting, you know, talking about it with other people and helped other people by being a part of this thing, but also now he's, you know, getting people calling him and having conversations like Tony Granato and, and Boyle and guys like that that have gone through the exact cancer. So, so, and then, you know what, honestly, I, I re, I, which is kind of funny. I reached out to Lance Armstrong through a friend of mine. Uh, and I, yeah. and I talked to Lance and it was about the, it was, it was about the bike thing. And he started laughing. He goes, you think I did that for the chemo? And I said, I don't know. I just wondered why you would ride the bike when you got out of there. Like, why were you like, cause he would go in and get his treatments. They would let him out right away and go home. He would stay at yeah. home until he reloaded. They were keeping me in there during these trials. So I was having to stay in the hospital. He goes, no, no, no. When I rode the bike, he goes, I rode it like a six year old. He goes, cause it, it, they can't, you just have no energy, but he goes, I did it because I had done it my whole life. And that's why I did. Yeah. But he goes, when yeah. I had to, my stays in the hospital, you know, I could tell. He goes, and by the time I was ready to go back in the hospital where you start to feel better, he goes, well, then I would be back normally riding, you know, like 100 miles or whatever they do a day. Like he said, I just go on a 100-mile run is nothing for those guys, right? Uh, I mean, you know, they'll sit on that thing for three, four hours. and just Forever. Go. Yeah. So I, he said, he says to me, he says, the funny thing is, and I said, I asked him about diet and he said, you know what, they, he, whatever God you believe in, he said, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. He said, but he said, you got to make your doctor, your God right now and listen to him, whatever he says, because mine was just telling me to put calories in me. Because the funny thing is I walked through the cafeteria one day and I looked at this apple fritter and he said, I looked at that damn thing for three straight days. <laughs> And he said, I don't eat stuff like that. He says, I'm just Mr. Fit. You know, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to touch it. And finally, I just grabbed it and said, you know, said, fuck it. Right. I'm going to, uh-huh. I'm going to have it. So, uh, and he said, and God, if I didn't eat them like every day for 10 days, I think I ate these uh-huh. apple fritters down in the cafeteria. And I started laughing. He goes, I wouldn't worry too much. Like, Get yourself healthy. And then, and he goes, and then, you know, worry about small stuff like that. So I text him one day. I just text him a picture of an Oreo cookie Sunday. That's all on the cafeteria rack. You could tell it was the cafeteria. It was the last one sitting there. I snapped the shot of it and I sent it to him. And he sent back, fucking A, buddy. He knew exactly <laughs> what I was talking about. So. Um, you know, geez, I, and I've thought of this and I, I thought about. And we all have to deal with our mortality one yep. day, and we're going to face it, right? Yep. But in this situation, the situation you're in and being faced with that possibility, 
how did you navigate the, that feeling? Because it, it, it must have come in your mind. I could die from this, right? And yeah. And how how did you deal with that? Well, you know, I, don't, I I can be honest with you. I didn't think about it very much, but I will tell you when it happens. Uh, they call it chemo brain or chemo fog, whatever they call it. It it's a you know I don't have that. I don't have that depressant personality, so I thankfully that I, you know, I didn't have those thoughts very often, but it's hard not to be realistic with yourself too. Right. Um, I, first of all, knuckles, I have never Googled leukemia. I have never looked at one thing about leukemia on the internet to this point. I still have never, Timmy, I don't know if you're a lie detector uh, kind of guy or whatever, but I swear <laughs> to God to you, I have not looked at leukemia on the, in the, on the internet because I believe there's not one thing that will come up on that screen that's going to be positive, that's going to make me fucking feel better that day. So that's the first thing yeah. I didn't do, right? I didn't go down that rabbit hole. And the second thing is, you know, I had those emotional breakdowns. Like I, I, I had one, you know, I told you this, this the, you know, about Twister and, and, and you know, I, Colin Twister and yeah, in the middle of the night. And I mean, I just had, I just, I just emotionally felt, uh, had a, had a, had a moment where I just, I, I was hyperventilating and crying and I was in the shower and then I kind of got my shit together and got out there. And again, I wasn't thinking rationally when I called Twister. But then I started thinking about it later. And I think the reason why was a lot of it, I felt like I, when you go in there, we, we, we were a mile wide and an inch deep. I said this before. We go in the hospital. We bounce from room to room. We hug kids. We shake parents' hands. We give out teddy bears. And and we leave and we don't realize the impact we made five minutes of our time is worth more than 5,000 of our dollars, but we never know whatever happened with that kid in room 22 or, you know, or what, you know, because we're, and that's not, we're, it's not our fault. We just, we, we go to the next floor and then we go to the next yeah. hospital and then we go to the next event for the policeman and the fireman and whatever else we got it, you know, but we never fucking st- stick around. And I think what happened with me was I was walking around that hospital and I, I, I just felt so bad for so many people. And I felt a responsibility to go in and talk to them and, and be a part of them. Like I was taking it on myself or something. And I just started getting myself so emotionally wound up in watching these people be sick. I was like, holy Christ, is that guy sick? And then think, and then I, it, it hit me at the same time. I'm three doors down. I'm the same fucking guy as the guy down the hall. Right. But uh-huh. we're in there and we're used to going in there and bouncing. And that's not how it works. That re, when reality yeah. says you're fucking staying cause you're one of them. Hey, you know, and leukemia is a tough motherfucker. He fights with both hands. he jump you and he can take a punch. Calling all hockey lovers. Upgrade your podcast experience by becoming an enforcer. Gain access to the greatest hockey doc ever, The Last Gladiators. And don't settle for ordinary. Join the Fight Club over on Patreon today. Those, well, those emotions, you talk, you've always been a guy with your emotions on your sleeve, similar to Knuckles, right? With that way. Um, but one of the things that us guys don't do often is is show our emotions and that that you know the part when we're alone and you know and I won't let myself feel sorry for myself no don't get it but you get on the pity pot a little bit yeah yeah and 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 you go there and and those tears that uh you know we don't show often to other people or if at all I mean, they're real and they come and, and for you to bounce right out of that, like you got to sit with it a little bit, but to bounce right out of it, how, what snapped you out of it? What snapped you out of it? Just Kelly Chase. That's the way I am. That's the way I am. 
No, you know what snapped me out of it? And I, I hate giving this guy, you know, I don't hate giving him credit because I love the guy because um, <laughs> Stu Grimson, and I tell yeah. this story all the time about him because I was played with him in Hartford and, you know, Grimmer and I think we fought 11 times or something like that. And when you wake up and he's sitting beside your bed, and that's the first thing you open your fucking eyes to in the morning. And then you can, I turned and looked at him. I said, you better do it now because yeah. you're 0-11. This is the best shot you got. <laughs> but anyways, he says to me, he says, hey, you got to slow down and not be worried about everybody else. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm fine. No, I'm fine. He goes, yeah, I know you're fine, but you got to stop worrying about everyone else and maybe just, you know, kind of worry about just you, Right. And just take care of you. And then you don't have to worry about how, you know, how things, you know, play out. Everyone understands. So I said, I'm not sure what you're talking about. But and he goes, well, let me let me ask you a question. If you if you walked out of here today and you went down and there was a homeless guy on the street on the sidewalk and he asked you for a dollar and you didn't have a dollar, what would you say to the guy? I'd say, I don't have a dollar to give you today. And he said, try that. I said, what? He said, try that line then. Try it. And he never said anything else. We went on to something else. And I'm sitting there at night going, you know what? It's okay not to call somebody back right away that called you when you're sitting in there. You know, yeah. you don't have to feel the responsibility of, of, shit the alumni association uh, i'm the chairman of the the whole damn thing and i'm i've got a you know a fiduciary responsibility to you guys i've got a responsibility to to the executive board and the board and the chapter presidents and the league and the pa and i'm like you know all this is in my head and then i'm like fuck it you know who i don't have a dollar to give today and so that's sort of how how it played to where I'm at right now. All right, that's awesome. Stu, the Grim Reaper. Um, so, so Kel, um, the, um, the charity uh, hockey game you had, yeah. uh, your sons played, I saw, uh, I watched a, a few clips on that, and Garth Brooks was there, Dirks Bentley, uh, big Jim McKenzie, who, who kind of ragdolled me one evening in Boston, and, and you talked about the other guy. I fought him. No, I fought the Grim Reaper the night before, and it was Chicago. Yeah. And then Big Jimmy McKenzie came in. I saw him squaring up with you, and then your son came over and taught him a lesson or two. Yeah, my son was just, so out of gas. It's so cool to see the hockey community, though. Like, and that's what I'm saying. Everybody loves you. Look at the people that come there for you to to stand up. And the hockey community is great. We don't. And not that we need the credit, but I don't think people really know how that community is <laughs> really pulls together in a time like this. And that game was just awesome, really, yeah. Yeah, to do that. Uh, like the, the outpouring of support from the fans, the number of fans that were there. How, how many people in the building? Yeah. Well, it, well, it's it can you can have 3,000 in there, but I think the fire commissioner was there and he was – not happy with what was going on there. So I think they're <laughs> well over that, but in any event, it was an unbelievable success because of the guys that showed up and I'm so grateful, you know, because of it, because what could have been just in a bunch of old farts playing hockey again and people going, okay, the nostalgia was there. That was really, really, it was, you know, anticlimactic. Uh, it started out good and it, went better very very good and then over the top by the garth going up and getting in the muck of 700 vips and just taking pictures and watching full-grown adults act like elvis presley had walked in it was like i was embarrassed for some of them quite honestly it was fucking embarrassing <laughs> but they uh -huh. they had their time and it was just it was great but you know we had the pipers uh glenn healy's brought in the you know the, the pipe three of the best pipers in Canada and himself you know the, the, they piped the guys in when they came out on the mats and there was 80 athletes entertainers 
actors, whatever act, you know, there, um, all wearing jerseys, all part of, uh, you know, just part of that club. And it was, it was fantastic. And then, you know, like the videos that were played of the alumni association, I think put it over the top because it started a little mellow, maybe with the Pipers, they did, uh, you know, they, they were, they, they were, they were fantastic when they did the song at the start. Yeah. And then Darren Kimball's daughter sang the anthem, you know, and, That's they, and awesome. they, Kimball, uh, Granado, myself, Boyle and, and Troy Murray, uh, were at, were on, on the ice for the presentations. And then, so Kimball's daughter, Logan, uh, London sang the, uh, uh, anthem. And then, the Layla, the young girl that had the, the blood disorder, remember when the Blues were going through the playoffs and she was with the Stanley Cup? Yeah. She's healthy as any kid could be right now playing hockey. She was the opening puck drop. Uh, That's awesome. I got Cam Jansen to do the opening face-off with Chelly. Cam won it straight back to the fucking goaltender. We had to go, we had to go be, make him go back and get the puck from the goaltender because <laughs> he didn't know you <laughs> Never taken a face off before. He <laughs> first one he's ever won, and he went straight back to the, and Brian Elliott had to make a save in that. So uh, it was, uh, it was, it was just that was great. And then I think this the intermission we played two halves, and I think the intermission was the best. I think uh, uh, the Pipers come out. They they uh, piped Hallelujah. Craig Nienhaus sang Hallelujah. They yeah. played the video. It was unbelievable. Trevor Rosen from Old Dominion sang. That he had the crowd wow. fired up. Dirks then sang Drunk on a Plane. Crowd was going ballistic then. Then Nina, they they went off. Nienhaus sang Sweet Home Alabama. Had the crowd just jumping again. We went in. We took a team picture on a separate sheet ice. Come back over to the big rink and and uh played the played the second half and it just was just an unbelievable affair and you know so if you were a 50 dollar seat which was just a ga or a standing room ticket or a 500 dollars ticket i guarantee you before you left you'd say i'd do that again and it was worth the money yeah that's so awesome those people come together and i i think uh you know, Tony, I've spoken to Tony quite a few times. We're teammates in New York, you know, and uh, just a wonderful guy, Tony Granado. The best. Just really. And then Troy Murray uh, played against them. The the names and Kimby, uh, one of us for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's the guy I have to reach out to because I didn't know. I'm glad you uh, made me aware of that. Are you ready to take your love for hockey to the next level? Join the Fight Club Raw Knuckles exclusive Patreon to unlock amazing perks like ad-free episodes, bonus interviews, and even a chance to win a game day experience with me in the Habs cave. Don't miss out on this ultimate hockey experience. You know, I, I, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but you played with Craig Janney, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's okay. You can talk about CJ. He was he was a fine-tuned athlete. <laughs> Let me tell you something about CJ right now. I'll tell you this right now. He's a dog oh. compared to what I look like right now. I look like oh. fucking Ron Perron. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> CJ, that's so funny. We were roommates um, uh, in Boston. And Kelly... We went out one night in Quebec City and went yeah. drinking. The whole team went out. Was, they did it every year. They played the last game there, and you go out for lunch. And the night before, the, the day before the game, you practice, go for lunch, drink. Everybody's half in the wrapper. We get back to the room, and Janny's in the room. He goes, you think you're fucking tough? Oh, out of yeah. nowhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and he yeah. shocked the shit oh, out of yeah. me, right? Yeah. I said, Siege, stop. And he gives me the, he's giving me the slap in the face. I miss Siege. Well, by the end of it, I had him down. For, he, he, I waited. He, he ended up taking his suit off, and I just let him, you know, put his guard down a yeah. little bit. I fucking jumped over there. I flipped the bed over. He kept going at me, right, talking. I flipped the bed over, and I got him under the bed, and I had the mattress over him <laughs> and just his head. His arms were under everything. And I just went, boom, 
boom. And then I started punching him, giving him little punches in the cheekbones. He came to the rink the next day. His oh, yeah. fucking head yeah. was swollen. Oh, yeah. And I mean, he That's got up in the morning and he said, you fucking asshole. I mean, hey, you're the one who fucking wanted some of it. You got some. Did the exact same thing to me in, in uh, San Jose. And I just one-timed him right in the forehead <laughs> on the shuttle, okay? Oh. And the next morning he had three bruises right here. Three in a oh, row. I, I love CJ. I love the guy. I absolutely I love, love him. Good man. Yeah. So listen, Twista, you got to get that uh, Twister, Chaser, oh, Chaser, does Twister, that every day here. Twister, Chaser, <laughs> right? Um, so w- w- right now, the prognosis: you're done with your treatments, you have finished I'm done with them. With my treatments, um, I go May 10, get a bone biopsy. Yeah, uh, it takes about two weeks for the scan to come back. Uh, once the scan's back, then they. Uh, hopefully give me the same news they gave me when they did the last one, which is you have no uh, cancer tissue within a millionth of a milligram. This is how sensitive the test is in any wow. tissue, even dead cancer cells. And we expect uh, you to stay in remission. You just got to keep getting checked. So a tenth is when I, when I go in and then I'll go in that day and they'll check my patella tendon, see if it's worth still saving and, and putting in uh, the three screws in and putting the tendon back on the front of my knee. They can't do yeah. that until the end of May, but they can go in and MRI it and see. Uh, so I'll have that done. And then at that point, they'll be able to tell me when I can start uh, having some of the amino acids and stuff, pe- the peptides and stuff like that um, injected or start taking different supplements to, to, to aid getting – some of the muscle back, hopefully. Uh, that's hey, listen. That's a great. Uh, the prognosis looks good, and um, so happy to hear that. Honestly, Thanks, a bro. year ago, getting the news a little over a year ago, yeah, getting the news you got and the battle you fought, and you're still fighting. Uh, it's a testament to who you are, and and again, the friends you have who who rallied around you to support you through all this. It's just awesome. I love you, buddy, and I really. I, I'm I'm happy I'm happy uh, uh, to the other side of this. So this thank is, you. hey man, I love you. Really. And I, I I love coming on. I appreciate you, and I apologize for my tardiness today. I I really didn't know about the time change, and I sure you were on the bike. You were on the yeah. Peloton. <laughs> I'd like to even tell you that. But I'm, I can't even do that anymore. Shit. Uh-huh. Anyway, well, well, listen. Thank you for having me, Knuckles. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. you guys. Uh, Tim, I know you keep knuckles on the rails, so. You know, so. <laughs> no, I appreciate you, Chaser, for sure. So thank you guys, and uh, anytime you want me, just call. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Hall of Fame member of the week, Pete Doherty. Pete, thanks for your support. Really appreciate it, and man, keep listening. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. If you want the raw, uncut episodes, be sure to click the link below to join the Fight Club on Patreon.